Yes, I do. And uh, I'm a practicing Christian. I'm Episcopalian. But you're right. As a philosopher, you're living among colleagues who, by an overwhelming majority, are uh, atheists. And some of them militant. So they don't just not believe in God. They think that <laughs> believing God is silly and, and something it's, uh, it's insidious. It's uh, detrimental. And, uh, and, and speaking to a philosopher like you, <clears throat> a good way of approaching the issue is to do it um, sort of in concentric circles, beginning with the, the most general objections and then the more specific objections. <clears throat> so the first objection is, is it irrational to believe in God? And the answer is no. And all philosophers, I think, uh, accept the proposition that to say God exists is not illogical. So that, that's already important. Yeah. So you can't be cut off at the pass <laughs> by saying, hey, stop. You know, um, if you were to say, you know, there are square circles, people would say, well, <laughs> let's stop right there. There are some who say, I don't know what God means, but most um, have a conception of God. The next rest, the, then the next objection, and, and that comes from a lot of philosophers. There is no evidence for God's existence. And, uh, and so the question is, what kind of evidence should, should we look for? And um, it's not scientific evidence, obviously. But then there is no scientific evidence for lots of things that we value, such as uh, beauty, morality, and uh, courage, grace. And, and, and what kind of evidence is it? It's evidence that some people clearly are blind to. You know, some people don't see beauty in a flower or, you know, in a, in a Rembrandt or uh, a Beethoven symphony, whatever it may be. So. There are some people who say, not be so, okay. <laughs> so it's contestable evidence. Right. But uh, isn't there a line between a concept or notion of God and the tangible things you mentioned, like beauty, or not tangible, but still you can point to something in the world that... Uh, right, right. So you have to point to evidence of divinity. Right. right? Okay. And so what's evidence of divinity? Well, it's... Uh, the behavior of, of saintly people. Yeah. And, and for some, it's uh, um, the beauty of nature and the sort of upwelling of gratitude that we feel when a sunset just takes our breath away or the, the kind of profound emotions that we have when we listen to the Christmas oratorio mm -hmm. by Bach. And, and we feel that even uh, if we don't <laughs> agree with the message, right? So last Christmas I was uh, at Lincoln Center uh, listening to the Christmas oratorio. And I bet half the people were atheists. So but that shows that there is sort of a fine line between the beauty, the sacred, and the divine. Uh, so uh, this is just to ward off, again, an objection, this time coming from philosophers, that that's inappropriate. You find divinity in things, and you're right, it has to be tangible. And uh, certainly in Christianity, you know, I mean, Christ, that, that's the great thing, you know, was divinity uh, become tangible. And uh, 
But then there's what we may call the, the, the sacramental conception of, of things, of works of art, uh, the beauty of nature. And then, you know, the just sort of stunning displays of courage and generosity. And then the next objection you get all the time is uh, the problem of evil, yeah. right? Can I uh, stop you? Uh, sure. Yeah. So um, the first thing you said was that uh, the evidence of divinity is uh, found in um, saintly uh, people. Of yeah. Religion. Right. Right. And um, the respect for science, I suppose, that you gave me. Yeah. Yeah. From, yeah. From physics up to um, consciousness, and um, right. it was a thoroughgoing um, sort of non-reductive naturalism, I suppose. It seems like <laughs> where is why I mean uh, you can explain everything or at least tell a more plausible story that we needed this stuff and so we came up with it and it sort of opens ways there to say okay like well I guess that was a myth let's honor it but w why should we believe in it or well is it uh, to? the fact non-reductive yeah. uh, naturalism is the admission mm -hmm. that you cannot reduce reality such as we experience it to basic elements plus some algorithm or recipe that tells us how to put it together so that we can predict the levels of complexity and their uh, properties, right? That's the problem of emergence. And so, so in the in the cosmological and, and uh, biological evolution of reality, things prop up yeah. that amaze us, right? right? And, and so the, the kind of imperious <laughs> naturalism that says, <laughs> there are no problems, there are no secrets, there are no <laughs> wonders, you know? Oh, oh. That's just the mistake. And, and the mistake is fueled by the confusion by the erroneous identification of uh, reduction with construction, right? You can't reduce everything yeah. in a sense, but you can't really reduce it, you know, right. because uh, as soon as you reduce, you lose, right. <laughs> right? right? So if, you know, we could reduce everything that's going on <laughs> right here <laughs> to uh, um, mental phenomena, the mental phenomena to uh, um, brain phenomena, the brain phenomena to neuronal phenomena, neuronal phenomena to uh, molecular phenomena. Right. Well, as it's, you, you sort of sharpen and deepen the focus, and you just lose what's been going on, right? Yeah. You know, you're now talking about neurons. You know, consciousness shows features, and as soon when the when features that we've previously not seen are pointed out, we're so charmed that we think, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> but, th you know, so strange loop, fine. <laughs> you know, reflexiveness, unpredictability, whatever. That's all? Well, no. <laughs> you know, those are features of consciousness. Yeah. And I, I, I agree that consciousness is not, you know, there are the so-called new mysterians who think, Consciousness is not reducible, yeah. uh, and I do think it's reducible. Mm -hmm. It's just not constructible, constructible. and uh, and so the you know one thing that that's obvious to anyone yeah. is that the that there are no proof proofs right. for the existence of God, right. and uh, and so. You know, if you ask me, well, what demonstration will prove you have? <laughs> the answer is none. Yeah. You know, but there's a difference between not being able to prove something in, in this compelling way yeah. that we find paradigmatically in mathematics and physics, yeah. and, um, and ways of talking reasonably and perhaps illuminatingly about something. <laughs> Uh, but as I said, if it's not compellingly demonstrable, 
it's contestable. That's, yeah. that's just the way it is. And the, uh, what Christians in particular have always been concerned about is the position right from the start that Christianity is not a secret cult. You know, or you have to sort of buy in on really strange, stupid <laughs> things. Right. You can talk about it and uh, you can explain it. Uh, uh, but these explanations are always pointing up something. And a person can always re say, well, you're pointing it up all right. I don't see it, however. <laughs> but, you know, that's a predicament that we're in a lot of times, right? This is unjust. This is unfair. Right. Don't treat the person that way. And people will say, what do you mean? <laughs> right? Well, or this is beautiful. This needs to be s preserved and honored and, and understood as a source of inspiration and grace. And people will say, you know, come on. There are two kinds of ignorance, yeah. um, intelligible and unintelligible. Right, and the um, and I think the 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 reason for emergence, our ignorance of how to do this is intelligible, and and the reason is that uh, the at the level of the um, the basic constituents, things become unintelligible. There are too many. Right. There are just too many. Yeah. And they lose their color, they lose their texture. So, um, so if a reality in bigger chunks yeah. is to make sense, it has to have emergent properties. Yeah. That's just the way it is. Right. And, and, you know, for for theists, divinity is one of the emergent properties. Right. Part of me starts wondering, once we, so I guess, I guess in, in this scientific mindset, we mm -hmm. I, I start, uh, I want to ask, like, when did you grow up with Christianity? You see, I'm, I'm looking for sort of um, extra information to make sense of you as a, as a philosopher who, uh, who believes in God and is a believer in history. Right. Well, you know, like all children, I was I was told stories, yeah. and I made sense of them as stories. And then, as I grew up, I uh, tried to understand things more deeply. And you know, I think the the philosopher's task is to uh, is to comprehend <laughs> the world. <laughs> How everything hangs together, right? right. right? And and, uh, and and so I uh, and to be more conscious and confident of their faith. Uh, that's that's as far as it goes, I think. And uh, you know, it's of course it must be troubling to a Christian and and to a a believer generally. That faith is declining, I mean, mm -hmm. and uh, especially in the advanced industrial countries, Europe, it's just declining rapidly, and it's slowly declining in this country also. And and so there's a philosophical question, you know, why is this happening? And of course, you know, <laughs> it's philosophy that engages the culture because there are no a, a priori reasons why it should happen or should not happen, and. Uh, the um, you know the how the culture moves that's sort of the the fundamental level of intelligibility there is no i mean uh, you, you just as in the case of consciousness you can point out certain features and antecedents and so on but how the culture changes why it changes, how it will develop, 
no one knows. I mean, Christians call this the work of the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> so Christians should think of, of these changes as tasks that are given to them by, by God, the task of understanding what's happening, and then, of course, the task of persuading people not by compelling argument, there are none, <laughs> but, you know, what uh, James uh, Davison Hunter has called faithful presence, right, and that is live a life that, uh, that persuades people that, you know, that the awareness of divinity is something that makes people more graceful, more generous, perhaps more even-minded than they would otherwise be. Although, you know, we always have to add to this that we can be an exemplar <laughs> of, of grace and generosity and, uh, and be an atheist. You know, and, and one that, in fact, shames most of us Christians in our attempts to be graceful and generous. Now, to try to comprehend the world, why are you adding this extra natural thing? My friend Robert Pack was a wonderful poet and essayist and uh, has been teaching at the university for quite a few years now, has written some poems that just take your breath away with their grace and their beauty. And, you know, he's the master of the classical forms, but also has a modern sensibility. And the way he puts these things are sometimes just wonderful. So one day I said, Bob, this shall not pass away. This is too beautiful. <laughs> and, and Bob has sort of a, he, you know, lives in the Jewish tradition, which is admirable and one that I admire. And uh, and then, and so he's always, you know, the immortality of 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 humans is is not a settled issue in in the Jewish tradition. But I could tell that <laughs> he he thought, yeah, perhaps <laughs> it shall not pass away. Right? So there is something in the beauty that tells you this this will last you know uh, the, and and it's part of a of, of a, a moral intuition that is the good guys are going to win right and yeah. things are things hang in the balance things are contested we're failures but there are these moments where we know the good guys are going to win. Why? You know, because we're all so smart. <laughs> and uh, this, uh, you know, this confidence that in, in its way is, is, is a knowing uh, just sort of surfaces in these moments. And obviously, they're not shared by a lot of people, but they can be very powerful. And, and so, you know, what Christians uh, should do is convey the power of these moments and, and uh, their intimations of, of reality. So, the, you know, the, con the conception of God, I think, that we should embrace in philosophy is God as a moral power, not as a physical efficacious power, although that's sort of subsumed under it. And, uh, you know, and as you know, for, I mean, Kant was sort of, was the first to do this in a somewhat difficult and unclear way, but, you know, eventually sort of look at the whole thing, uh, what he says about God, it's clear that for 
him. God is not a physically effective force, but a morally necessary uh, force. And I think he's right about that. Both of those intuitions, it feels like, can be made good in, on atheistic grounds. It's mm. higher, thicker levels. Why not expect these stunning, beautiful things? I can see a great work of art and say, wow, this is going to be lasting forever in the human spirit and in its yeah. materialization as far as, as long as we're going to be around. That doesn't seem to diminish it or diminish its, its wonder. Or its oh, yeah. I mean, there, there is the opposing view that says, Eternity devalues everything, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's the preciousness of the moment. Right, yeah. This yeah. shall <laughs> not pass yeah, again, <laughs> you know, yeah, this yeah. That, that makes it so precious. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a case where uh, intuitions just diverge. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but if you, um, you know, I mean, it's obvious that humans can transcend the actual world in different ways. And uh, so to some extent, everyone has to claim a realm that goes beyond the physical mathematics. Is, uh, but although it's, that's also contested, there are sort of nominalists who think that mathematics is derived from, from uh, physical nature. But most mathematicians are Platonists, right? So they believe that there is a, a realm, an eternal <laughs> realm of numbers that they work in, that where they make discoveries and so on. Uh, and then, of course, you know, there are things like modal realism, where reality consists of infinitely many possible worlds. We just occupy one of them. Uh, that we give a proper name, actual. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, there's a kind of very narrow-minded physicalism that's called presentism, you know, where people say uh, only the present is real. But that's, you know, a very cramped and strange way of thinking about reality. We can recall the past. We can anticipate the future. So there are different ways in which we can transcend it. Now, if things of beauty and, and, and ethics are thought to be transcendent and eternal, I don't think you can stop there, right? E eternal, eternal for whom? You know, just out there, some some place. You know, nobody will ever know or eternal for us. Right. And uh, you know, and after all, the, the this this shall not pass away. Pertains to friendships as much as it pertains to to uh, um, you know sunsets or right. poems or whatever. And uh, so. Uh, and, and again, you know, for Kant, the God is not sort of a moral force that's out there all by itself. <laughs> but, you know, it's connected with uh, human immortality. You were saying earlier that it uh, seems like a belief in God can bring out the best in people. Uh, yeah, know, right, right. Grace and what have you. Uh, but uh, could it not also be argued that there are, uh, that it's a, a cushion or a way for uh, sort of short-circuiting so much thought. And also, I guess by extension, would it not be uh, uh, your task as a philosopher to uh, first and foremost sort of say you don't know, and then... Uh, right, 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 right. They have gone off, you know, into right. terrible places, you know, to bring people the good news. So I think that's the first thing that should be at least acknowledge that we have to do the math, right? And of course, it would be extremely difficult to do, mm, right? How you total up the bad, how you total up the good. And then there's another um, accounting that you should do, and that is, you know, 
what's the bad things that um, believers have done, and what's the bad things that atheists have done, you know? And, and so I think this is just, as it stands, a really bad argument. And, but the other argument that uh, the existence of evil makes it impossible for people to believe in God, you get all the time, right, right from, from atheists. Yeah. I might be a, a Christian if it were not for the problem of evil, they say. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, there's the, the, the famous argument that um, if you uh, attribute to God three properties that are usually attributed to God, uh, omniscience, omnipotence, and omnibeneficence, there can't be evil. One of them has to drop out. And if one of them drops out, no problem. But you know, which one are you going to drop? And, uh, and as you may know, Harold Kushner wrote this wonderful book, When uh, Bad Things Happen to Good People. And he just drops the uh, omnipotence. And he says, God is not omnipotent. So God cannot prevent evil. God is not omnipotent. And I find that difficult to accept because we can prevent evil. <laughs> we do it very often, right? So God can't, but we can. That doesn't seem to make sense. So in, in reply to atheists, the first thing you have to point out that they don't have an explanation of evil either. Right? So when they say, you can't explain evil. But do we need an explanation of evil? Yes, we do. Why? People, people cry out for an explanation. They say, there why did this happen? Why did this happen? Yeah. Yeah. They want an answer. But there isn't one. Why make one up? Well, right. But then you're agreeing with me that the often implied view of atheists that they do not have a problem with you is mistaken. There's a thing that we but can I mean, call the moral economy. It's not contradicting anything that an atheist believes. Or does it? What did I miss? What did I miss? You're right. But, um, well, <laughs> <laughs> there's one thing that atheists are burdened with just as theists are, and, and it's this. There's something uh, that, uh, something we can call the moral economy. Hmm. Typically good things happen to good people. Right. So if you're uh, a faithful husband, a diligent worker, uh, a prudent steward of resources, um, a good citizen, a good citizen. You'll be fine. You'll be a good person. You know, you have a nice family. You, you will be provided for for the future, uh, for illness, and people will respect you and love you. If it were true that no good deed goes unpunished, mm -hmm. we'd all go insane, right? Because there is a moral economy. And the problem with evil is that it violates the moral economy. Yes. Something that should not happen, mm -hmm. something that must not happen, yeah. happens. And, and people are upset. Of course. You know, they say, this should not happen. Why did it happen? They want an explanation. Moreover, they want a satisfying explanation. And a satisfying explanation is such that when you get it, you say, I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Right? And there are explanations that work that way. Right. You know, there's a puzzle, a problem, and you say, oh my God, what's going on here? You get the explanation, you say, oh, I see, that makes sense. Right. There is no satisfying explanation for evil. There's nothing you can say at that you can claim uh, to uh, 
get you the answer. Um, now I see. Yes, that makes sense. Right. People, no people don't say that. Yeah. Right. So yeah. the, it robs you of your sleep. Huh. And if it doesn't rob you of your sleep, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> right? If you say, oh, I don't care. I'm not 19 young guys, you know, they identify. Uh -huh. Well, tough, you know, I got to expect that. Look at the statistics. Or worse, why does it happen? Well, look, there was this fire, you know, and there was right. this downdraft, and all of a sudden the fire jumped. It was all physically necessary, you know, and then they were depri deprived of oxygen. And that's the explanation. So does the young wife of one of them say, Oh, I see. That makes sense. Right. Right. No. But just, just because we want a satisfying answer doesn't mean there has to be one. True. True. And but but my my point is that when uh, uh, people say you're a theist, mm -hmm. you can't deal with the problem of evil, and if you could, I might become. A theist, right? Then they act as though there could be and should be a satisfying explanation. If there were, they would become theists. Yeah. But it has so nothing to do with theism versus atheism. The atheist says there's a problem of evil. Yeah. Your God should be the answer, right? Should be a should be the satisfying explanation. But God is not, so therefore I can't be a, a believer. <laughs> but you know, there's the assumption that there should be a satisfying answer, and and uh, and and, uh, and I've had atheists who said, "Oh look, look at evolution, right?" Uh, so we distinguish between uh, physical evil and moral evil. Moral evil. Why? You know, it's evolution has uh, made a, endowed us with anger and cruelty, and you know, because in certain situations you have a survival advantage. So that's why people—that's <laughs> why evil happens, <laughs> and and uh, that certainly doesn't. You know, would anyone in the Holocaust who has suffered in the Holocaust say, "Oh well, now I see. You know, something went wrong with evolution. That's why six million." Jewish people died. So nonetheless, what do you do with the problem of evil? To be enraged and to want revenge. If that person says, I forgive you, it's OK. Some of the, the sort of what I call the toxic element of evil is annihilated. Right? Or if a person has suffered physical evil, uh, you know, such as the loss of a beloved, you know, like the people in Arizona. Instead of understandably just wailing and breaking down and being desolate, says, you know, I have to cope with this. We all feel a little better, right? So At least in some cases, people experience evil as a task they have to cope with through forgiveness or fortitude. And, but it's important to recognize that you cannot demand fortitude or forgiveness. Of course. Right. But when it happens, it's a good thing. And so it's a task. It's a test. You think. You know, you might say to yourself, or a person might say to herself, this terrible thing will determine who I am. Right? And, and, and there's this parallel between the gra grateful experience of natural beauty <laughs> and the experience of evil as a task. In that theists then take one step that atheists don't take, 
and don't have to take, I recognize, and it's this. We overcome with gratitude at the sight of this sunset, you know, the sun setting over the Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> and grateful to whom, right? And Christians say, yeah, grateful to whom? Grateful to God, right? And similarly with the test, tested by whom? Tested by God, right? And there are certain sayings that are cheap um, when not said in first person, but sort of given as medication to people who have suffered evil. Uh, and one of them is, God does not test you beyond your powers. Right? Or God gives you the test, but God also gives you the grace. That's the message of Harold Kushner. Right? Uh, the, he says, don't ask God to prevent evils. <laughs> ask God to give you the grace to cope with evil. And uh, so I think that's certainly the Christian uh, response to evil. But it's a response that, that can be proclaimed only in first person singular, in the sense, I hope that when evil darkens my door, I'll be forgiving and I'll be brave. And you have no right to demand it of other people. And uh, I, I think things are slightly different with a fellow Christian. To a fellow Christian, you can say, yes, this is a terrible test. And no one will blame you if you say that test goes beyond my power. Uh, but trust in God, right? And of course, some people, uh, Rawls, John Rawls, lost his faith in at the sight of evil, right? Uh, one was a uh, a, co a coincidental event where he he was supposed to go out on a patrol in the Second World War, and for some reason was reassigned and a friend of his went and his friend died and uh, then the other is the the news from the Holocaust and so you know Christians have to accept that evil the experience of evil turns people from God I mean they can no longer believe in God so Rawls doesn't make it clear whether he's become, whether he then became an agnostic or an atheist. And it's interesting that he, he thinks ethics can stand, in any case, independent of, of God, especially his ethics, right, of rights and liberties. Seems like the God that uh, you've been speaking about now um, as a moral force now that you formulated it, um, seems a far cry from the God that it seems like I learned about uh, growing up or mm -hmm. the God that uh, the Christian God a few centuries back. Right. And th that's another uh, argument that atheists make to <laughs> defeat the Christians and the theists I generally. Then it made it... Uh, Weinberg made it. And it goes like this. You say that you can't explain the world unless there's God. Because you say, why is there a world? And your answer is, because God made it. But if the answer, if the question is legitimate once, it's legitimate always. Yeah. So <laughs> if, you, if you say, why did the uh, why do, does the world exist? Because God made it. You can't stop there. You have to say, why does God exist? Yeah. Who made God? Yeah. You know, and, and uh, then, then it says, so, it's super God? 
Well, who made super God? Super duper God. <laughs> so there's an infinite regress. And, uh, and in, in, in one sense, Thomas F. Aquino already had an answer to this, as did Augustine. And the answer is, uh, you're asking a question within the temporal order, but you can ask, who made the temporal order? And, uh, and God um, perhaps has created an eternal temporal order because God stands outside of time. So there's no contradiction in saying God has created time eternity. And even in medieval philosophy, fine distinctions were made between different kinds of eternity. And uh, so, uh, right, and sometimes this surfaces in the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Um, the, so one way of pointing out how God is a, a sort of the end point of questioning is to say, God cannot be the end point of questioning when it comes to causality. Right. You have to keep that open and just, you know, so is it the Big Bang? You know, or does the Big Bang come out of nothing? Or does it come out of quantum fluctuations? Or is it one of a multiverse? You know, they all. So you leave that to physicists and cosmologists. So other questions where the why question, why did this happen, or why did so-and-so do this, become inappropriate. And there is. And it's in the face of generosity. Right? So if somebody is just generous to you in, in a way that overwhelms you, um, a woman would say, why did she do it? <laughs> you know, what is she after? Yeah, you know, right. What is she getting out of it? You have misunderstood generosity. So the experience of generosity is sort of a terminal experience. Mm -hmm. right. And so we should think of God as the one who has given us in this unsurpassable gift of generosity, the universe, right? And so it's, it's not causation, it's donation, it's a giving. And, and then, you know, you sort of give the Weinbergs and the Dennets the, the causal chain, right, to pursue forever. Uh, and, but point out that there is something that encompasses the presence of, of reality that goes beyond the physical without denying it. Right? And that is the sheer wonder of it. Your view seems contingent upon having a life that's from the get-go you you can be grateful for. Or, uh, but what of someone who's, who's born into utter destitute um, and has a miserable life from beginning to end? Clearly, the presence of God differs from culture to culture, from person to person. And some are such where, you know, it's impossible to say that God was present in any way, you know. So, is God present to Hitler? You know, but then also is God present to, you know, a child in in a third world country who, you know, suffers from from early infancy on and dies at a young age, you know, where's God's presence? And uh, 
that's just uh, part of evil and the these people are evil they suffer evil and there is no facile reply to why are they evil why do they suffer evil um, that's just the uh, the same problem of, sure. of evil yeah. and uh, and you know Christians believe that I mean they're so called universalists who believe that everyone will be saved right. uh, no one will be lost and uh, I'm a universalist <laughs> but uh, you know you have to be very careful and and you know reserved in, in, in making that claim people are going to be saved See, you know you tell that little kid oh don't worry about it <laughs> you too will be saved uh, one thing that's obvious is that we have to resist the evil doers and help those who suffer evil does the um, the fact uh, where you have all these different religions different mythologies to respond to different cultures um, does that make uh, the belief system of Christianity in which you were born suspect to you because that the first break I had I suppose with the belief of God was coming here and, and this is how I suppose the human mythology so I thought whoa there's all these other stories you know yeah. what's to say that the one I grew up with which was uh, in my life a, more of a permissive source than anything there are two questions one is the variety of religious experience right. <laughs> and the other is uh, the perversion of of Christianity and, and again we find this perversion that we call fundamentalism in all religions yeah, Hindu fundamentalism Muslim fundamentalism Christian fundamentalism and uh, it's uh, so that's that's one question the other question is why is there Islam Christianity the Jewish tradition I don't know Germanic mythology <laughs> uh, things like that and uh, people differ in in their sensitivity to to the divine and then of course others benefit or suffer from from that greater sensitivity or insensitivity um, but the um, experience of the divine is almost universal right, right. and uh, and then you know the, the people have asked themselves and written about the question how God develops and you know people have written the biography of God <laughs> so the varying understanding that people have had of of God is, and, and the Hebrew the Jewish tradition is of course the, the best example of how the conception of God changes and uh, I think it changes along with culture uh, so and you know God reveals divinity in, in different ways at different times and there are always admixtures that are unacceptable you know when say the worship of divinity is connected with human sacrifices say or intimately connected with invidious class distinctions and so on uh, and I do think that just as in ethics there is some sort of progress there has been some kind of progress in, in theology in people's understanding of God so uh, the fact that uh, there have been so many varied uh, expressions of, of God or experiences of God um, does not uh, make God uh, this contingent thing rather 
it just shows how culture is contingent and changing, and therefore how uh, God reveals Himself today. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that divinity is not exhausted by one particular tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and, you know, just as we're born into a culture and happen into a, a marriage and then have certain children, these are all, in, in one sense, totally contingent facts, you know. Why do you take a right turn instead of a left turn? At the right turn, you know, you uh, ran into this person <laughs> who turned out to be your spouse and partner. <laughs> you know, why did that happen? It's totally contingent. <clears throat> but contingency and profound meaning are not incompatible. Right. So we're born into a religious tradition, and then some of us uh, are sort of tossed out of it, lose it, rediscover it, and, uh, um, and I think these changes are profoundly meaningful, just as the contingencies of an individual life are profoundly meaningful. No, no, no. But it was a pleasure, so I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Okay, I'll leave. Take care. <laughs>